those of you who were here last, uh, at, at the last post meeting, we, uh, we were introduced to, I guess, the concept of tiny houses and, and why they were so uh, prevalent in our society. Can I just get a show of hands? Anyone who was here last week to hear Ian Ugarty speak? Fantastic. That's most of you. Excellent. So, you would know that the Australian uh, housing landscape has got many, many extra bedrooms. Um, Ian ran through a lot of the, the statistics on uh, tiny house living on, well, he ran through the statistics on the current, the current state of play in the property market. And to sum up, the traditional housing market is unaffordable for many, unattainable and unwanted, unsuitable. It's not necessarily the most efficient of buildings, but they are all the same in many regards, because it's fitting a process and a system that's been developed over many years. And that system, that process has developed both to propel and, and to perpetuate the current housing market. And it's also worked with the industry to support that housing industry, not necessarily the people is providing housing for. So what I hope to talk to you very briefly about today is three things really. One is why you would consider living in a tiny house, what benefits there might be for you. Two, uh, what you might need to consider and, 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 and be able to get your head around and achieve in order to successfully make that transition. And, and three, where to next for the tiny housing industry? Where do we go to from here? They're starting to be built by professional organisations such as my, myself, Tiny Home Rolling Pasture. They're also being built by people who recognise their utility, recognising that they don't need a team of builders and architect necessarily, and um, and, and several under, uh, several under, several thousand dollars worth of other staff to put together. And they're the three things I'd, I guess I'd like to share with you and, and talk with you about today. Um, my background is as a travelling surfer. I've travelled the world surfing and staying in some very, very tiny, very sparse accommodations. And I found that the harder I worked here in Australia, the more time I could spend overseas surfing and the less I spent on accommodation, the longer I could stay there. So that was my attraction to, to living in, in small, sparse areas. Um, it certainly wasn't a choice to be a minimalist. It was just easier to travel through airports with a surfboard rather than accumulate a, a plethora of, of tools and and, and things and, and, and thingly bobs back here in Australia that I, I just didn't find a use for. And it really surprised me, the further I travelled, just how happy people are with less than what I would consider, or at the time considered the usual trappings of, of modern society or, or a civilised society. So that, I guess, changed the way I looked at what was necessary in life, what was necessary in housing, and and since then I've stayed in some, I guess, unorthodox accommodations such as uh, a Dutch barge, a 50 foot Dutch barge on the River Thames right in the, in, the, in the heart of London. So that was a really unique experience for me because it allowed me to uh, have a base to travel all throughout Europe as well as live very simply in a, in, a, in a very small, every, every, every apartment I suppose is small in, in, in London, but uh, um, on a Dutch barge, it's actually bigger than some of the apartments that I did visit throughout London, and I'm just, just thanking those people now for, for turning their mobile phones off, we do appreciate that. Um, I've also lived in a, in a bus, okay, a, 56, a 52 seater bus that was converted, um, and I'd take people on surfing tours uh, with that bus. And, uh, and that was a bit of fun as well. 
And I guess it allowed me to see what, what a life uh, unhindered by the constraints of, of, um, of, of four walls in, 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 two, in 200 square metres um, could be. Have we got anyone here, and I'd really like to hear your experience, who has lived in some unconventional dwellings? Whether it's a tiny house or something that's just a little bit outside of what you'd expect everyone to go home to today. Anyone? You have? <laughs> I converted out. It was the old sister's building. Right. Which is right on the street. And it's just one room yep. with a little tank on the back. And I put a kitchen and bathroom out. I put a kitchen and bathroom out the back. But it was really just one room. The whole thing. And so I've lived tiny in that way. So it was... Uh, it was 35 square metres, I think. 35 square metres, okay. Okay, thanks Julia. So 35 square metres in, in one room. Yeah. Have you ever found that you're able to be in more than one room at a time? Um, ever? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think yeah, any of us have figured, figured that one out yet. So you, you're, you can only ever be in one room at a time. So why not have everything in that room? Uh, anyone else been in, in some unorthodox type accommodation or, or, or living? I was studying in Indonesia and uh, people, they were living in the just, uh, living in the small room, four, five, six rooms, and only one kitchen, community kitchen. Family, a family living? Family living as well in the same place. Uh, like homestay, they call, they call Kos. Okay. Uh, very small place just, but there's a toilet and bathroom inside and just only one bed. It was really fun, three months. I really enjoyed to have community kitchen to share with them and it was a great environment, yeah. If you just um, let us know your name and where you're from. My name is Zeno Bruce and uh, I come from Vietnam. I was born and grew in Vietnam, so the housing is very basic, as this uh, gentleman just said. So I was born and grow in that kind of condition. Thank you. Anyone else uh, like that word? Here we go. Hello, Paul Brown here. Uh, Maribara Way, Sandy Straits, Big Tin Shed. Yeah. Big Tin Shed. Sleeping and eating at night inside, outside, all undercover area. Um, yeah, I couldn't be happier. Outside toilet, composting toilet, um, hot water on demand shower. Beautiful. Recommended? Everyone. Except for the Anyone else uh, care to contribute to this conversation? You know, this is great, we've got some really different types of living but probably not what we're all going to go back to tonight. Which would you prefer? Would you prefer that sense of community, that sense of intimacy with a group, or to be all spread out throughout a huge house? Hello, my name is Rita and I'm from the Sunshine Coast. And when I left home, I moved into a little granny flat sort of thing. It was the size of a single garage with just the bedroom off to the side. And in those days, of course, I was very minimalistic. However, over the time, I've done the grow into the big homes. And now I'm back into a situation where, yes, I've got a big home, but I've invited the community in. So I've got four bedrooms and three of those are let out to absolutely lovely, gorgeous people who come through, say hi, stay for a period and move on. Feedback has always been exceptional which I'm very proud of that, but um, it's just nice to have people come in and enrich my life. So yeah, I'm, I'm sort of both ends of the spectrum, but being able to combine it all very successfully. Thank you. Good Anyone else uh, like to have a word while we're here? All right, so what we're looking at, I guess, is, you know, what, what do these people see in living in a tiny house or living in an unconventional way. Um, what are the benefits for them? I think I think we've heard quite a few. 
And let me just try and summarise some of those benefits for you. Uh, here's, here's some reasons why you might uh, consider living in a, in a tiny house. First of all, it's easy to maintain. Anyone who has a house knows how difficult it is, to, how much energy is needed to, to accomplish the task of cleaning it. Uh, less time cleaning. Uh, it's less expensive, of course, um, to heat it and, and, and cool it, uh, keep the temperature right. Um, if you're using more um, efficient methods of, 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 of insulating anyway, then that's going to be that's going to be better in the long run. Uh, it's it's quite mentally freeing as well. So, uh, w with all of our possessions, the more stuff we own, the more energy we spend uh, thinking about how to um, how to how to store them, how to how to manage them. Um, you can also get more time in a tiny, tiny house uh, because you, you you freed yourself up from some of those pressures of life. Uh, it does encourage fa family bonding as well, having a smaller area. Um, you're, you're interacting with them more, there's no hiding uh, where there is a problem to face. Um, also, there's less, less decorating to do. Um, you, you don't have to hang a Picasso on every wall. Um, less tempted to buy things I suppose because there's just no room to put everything um, uh, there's a there's a wider market to sell to uh, a smaller more affordable house is, is is obviously within reach of more people um, and what I am particularly interested in is in is tiny houses on wheels and the reason I'm particularly interested in tiny houses on wheels is that they are very much on sellable um, you don't have to sell the land that goes with them. You don't even have to own the land that goes with them. Some people are, are very curious as to as to why um, uh, or how to go about finding land once they have a tiny house, and uh, and other people, I guess, are just curious about um, uh, where they can where they can park it. What 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 is expected in terms of rent? Um, on someone else's land uh, and, and what we're finding is that people are finding you know, great success with fostering that that spirit of community uh, I can see I can see that that in times to come tiny houses on wheels especially will be embraced by people with an elderly relative um, or, or, or that elderly relative may, may embrace tiny houses to live in conjunction with their family uh, on, on the same property, though not necessarily in the same dwelling. So if you've got uh, someone who needs, or not necessarily requires uh, medical attention or, or constant supervision, but still, you know, it's nice to know that someone is, is only a QE away, literally, um, to make sure that they're okay and you can check on them whenever you like. So I, I think that they're moving into the, into the senior market. There's a, great, there's a great market there for tiny houses, a great um, amount of people who will see the benefit of being able to move, roll in and roll out a tiny house on wheels to be able to look after family. Um, some people don't have that, that, that family connection, but there still is an opportunity to get that community connection. We can, we can imagine a world where, um, well, we, we see it every day, where there's someone who maybe is living alone and they are looking after a big house. Um, and, and as people get older, they, they tell me it's, it's very difficult to look after that big house. Cleaning gutters, um, uh, mowing yard maintenance and so forth. So if a, if a young family, fit and neighbor were to, were to share uh, the land space with them on a tiny house with a tiny house on wheels it would it really foster some some great community spirit and, and and interpersonal relationships that that older person may not get otherwise um so i think i think that there's some some fantastic community bridging processes that can happen with a combination that's that's more uh geared towards people being able to um own their own house so they can hang a picture wherever they'd like to so that they can live the lifestyle that they want to live and have the time to enjoy their hobbies 
their interests because they're not necessarily tied to an excessive mortgage that requires them to wake up with an alarm every morning and travel to a job that they might not necessarily love to make money to be able to afford the car that gets them to work and the clothes that they need to work in and buy things to impress people that they don't like. So, what I guess I'm talking about here is, is lifestyle, um, lifestyle engineering. Working out what's going to work for you and your lifestyle and gearing everything else around it to try and hit those goals. And a tiny house on wheels is just a part of that. But it is a way that, that, that I can see will allow people to step outside of what's expected of them and instead be able to make decisions in a self-determinatory way to live the lifestyle that they want to live. Now, when I started here today, I, I talked about three things that I wanted to, to share with you. Can you remember what they were? I can't, so I'll just start up. I remember one, um, which was some of the benefits of living in a tiny home. Uh, the second was um, how to do it, how to transition into, into, into living in a tiny house. Well, first of all, I guess you'll need to really get a good sense of what's essential for you to live and disregard the rest. By doing that, we can focus on once again, the lifestyle that we're craving, that we want to live, so that we're not distracted by anything else. Living in one room certainly has its, its challenges, as a few of you have experienced. But if everything you've got, or everything you need, is in that one room, well, it's going to be a lot easier to find. <laughs> you can still lose stuff, yeah. <laughs> Keys, keys are a big one, aren't they? Keys, wallets, home. Uh, one other thing that I, I, I want to quickly broach um, before I, I throw it open to you uh, for, for more discussion is where do you put a tiny house? Where to from here for the tiny house industry? And personally, I'm, I'm talking from the, the standpoint of tiny houses on wheels, not necessarily tiny houses, or not at all tiny houses on foundations. Well, I'm simply looking at it from the aspect of being on wheels. And being on wheels, a tiny home completely falls under the jurisdiction of the Department of Transport because it is a vehicle. There's no foundations going into the ground and therefore it's not classed as a, a, a foundation that needs approval from any council. So in having said that, a tiny house on wheels is not either the concern nor responsibility of the council. In order for a council to have any opinion on your tiny house on wheels, it would need to first of all prove that you were living in it. It would need to, um, I mean, if, if you'd have to invite them onto the property to be able to talk to them, to, to show them, uh, to show them this. So if you were too busy to meet with them forever, then there would, there would be there would be no no need for council to, to be involved at all. Council is catching up. There, there are many councils around Australia who are open to and are actually having dialogue with people in the tiny house community to understand what they are first of all. And I think that that's a process that we'll need to go through before we can move on. And when I say move on, what does that mean? Well, I think councils will want to know exactly what a tiny house is and isn't. Is it a caravan? Well, simply by its terminology, people are talking about them as if they're not. People are talking about tiny houses on wheels as if they are not a temporary housing option. For some people, they're looking at tiny houses on wheels as if it's their forever house or at least a semi-permanent dwelling. And that really doesn't fit into council expectations, council guidelines and experience. Except 
in the instance of caravans. <coughs> so as you can imagine, this beautiful area of the Sunshine Coast, as well as the Gold Coast and so forth, <coughs> were inundated with caravans. Tents and all sorts of shanties, including our, our lovely islands through the Great Sandy Straits and beyond. And unfortunately, a lot of people were injured, or worse, by structures falling in, gas explosions, electrical malfunctions, and so forth. And as a result of that, the council, who had taken on the role, because we gave them permission to do so, as our guardians, and also because you can't vote if you're not around to do so, Council put in, in, in their bylaws all sorts of rules and regulations which stopped people from hurting themselves. That was their intention. In reality, what we find now, what we're, that there's a common voice that, that acknowledges that this control from, from Council has impeded their ability to determine their own lifestyles. So that frustration is quite evident in, in a lot of the people I speak to today about tiny houses and alternative living. So we've got a council that has responded to previous bad calls and, and bad judgments and, and, and poor decisions by other people. And that's reflected on us. So we are living through that now. But nothing's going to change unless we try and change it to reflect what's happening now so that in the future it'll be easier for people to determine their own lives and lifestyle. Do we have any representatives from the Sunshine Coast or Noosa Regional Council here today? Good. No, it's, it, it, I, wish there, I wish there was someone here from, from a council that we could reach out to to open some dialogue with. That's, that's, that's really what um, what's needed at the moment, is to open dialogue in a framework, in a context that is able to be understood by both the council and by the tiny house community. So what we're looking to achieve, I suppose, is some sort of uh, conversation that sets apart tiny houses on wheels from anything else. Unfortunately though, when we do that, they will become their own entity and they will be subject to rules and regulations in their own right. So I can see that there's going to be a process, an ongoing process of first of all separating tiny houses on wheels as completely separate from caravans because they have the technology um, to be self-contained and safe without some of the, the, the previous concerns and, and worries about living in a mobile environment. But once that happens, once that distinction is made, I am concerned about what will they be classed as, what rules, rules and regulations will go into not only building them, but also the use of them. At the moment, it's perfectly within the, the bylaws of the of the Maroochee Shire, of the uh, the regional Shire Council here on the Sunshine Coast, at least, to stay in a tiny house on wheels because it does fall under the, the same regulations as a caravan. To live in it for up to four weeks without a permit, and after that amount of time a permit is required. On the Gold Coast there are zero days available to dwell in a tiny home or a caravan outside of a caravan park. So there's some I guess extremes. I'm still looking for a, a, a shire throughout Australia that expressly acknowledges tiny houses. There are a few now that are starting to have dialogue with community members, and that's fantastic. But more work needs to be done, 
and it needs to be done, I guess, in the right way with a, with a, with a unified approach uh, so that we can have open dialogue with these councils and give them all the information that they need to be able to make some decisions that reflect how its constituents want to live. Now, I really do appreciate you all for coming out here today uh, to listen, and I um, will pass it over, uh, pass, it, pass the microphone back to Robin. Yeah. Well done, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Ben. Fantastic. Lots of good information there and lots of things for us to continue to think about. Uh, I'm going to invite Julia up. And so what we'll do is we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll talk to Julia. Well, no, Julia will talk to us. <laughs> and then Sabine was keen to say something and I know that Jimmy was also keen to say something too. And we might leave um, questions until the end and then you can kind of mill about. Uh, unless you've got some really, really strong question that you think is going to be a game changer uh, that we all need to hear, otherwise we'll keep moving on. I think, thanks, Ben. Brilliant. Julia. Oh, have you got any specific, you're quite right, yes. Anyone got a question or two for Ben? Oh yes. Um, do you know what capacity council has to police, for example, Sunshine Coast Council post that for how they enact after that, four weeks ago. Ah, so, hang on. <laughs> August, uh, I'm really curious, if you get that again, if you don't mind. Yeah, no worries. Great question. Yeah, I'm just curious to know what capacity Council has after, for example, a four week period of staying in either a caravan or a tiny home to enforce you to leave or what, for example, the penalty is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's often asked in, in my circles, I guess. Okay. Uh, unless you were to go and tell council that that you, you'd started day one, I'm, I'm here now in my in my tiny home on, on this piece of land over here, in, in the centre, we're right there. Start the countdown. When that, how are they going to know that you've been there for four weeks? How are they going to know that you're there at all? And 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 my. My best response to that is, the only way that they would know that you were there at all is if someone complained. Because council just don't have the, the human resources to go around and observe looking for tiny houses on wheels, whether, whether it's on wheels or not. People, um, people living in structures that, that, aren't, that haven't gone through the process of giving council the revenue they need to enable them to issue a permit for someone to dwell in, in an occupancy. Um, if they don't know you're there, the only way that I can really see how they would know, unless you told them, was that if someone complained about you. And you know, that's, that's something we all want to avoid, the neighbours complaining. Um, how do you do that? I don't know. What happens if you are discovered by council, well first of all they would need to prove that you're living there. How are they going to do that? Well they need to come on to your land inspector. How are they going to get there? You'd have to invite them on. So I, you know, to answer your question thoroughly, there's, there's a lot that has to happen before you get to the point where they say okay we four weeks is up. Okay so but if you do invite them onto your property and and they say oh when did you move in and you say oh it was yesterday and then the neighbours complain, and then you're given four weeks to evacuate. Well, if you're in a, on a tiny house on wheels, there's plenty of time to pull up stumps and, and move on to somewhere else. Uh, all it takes is an ad on social media to say, hey, I've got a tiny home. Um, is anyone interested in, in uh, receiving payment or in-kind services for me to stay on their land while I repair their fences or, or pay your rent? Or, or, or feed your cattle while I'm away, or whatever it might be. So I think the, the, the transient nature, nature of tiny houses negates a lot of that problem anyway. Um, and I just want to keep going with, with, with that answer, if that's all right. I, you know, I, won't be able to, I won't be able to say what the penalty is, but I would imagine that council don't want to impose a penalty, they want you to move. 
So that would be their focus rather than imposing any type of penalty. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I know that uh, on Facebook there are a couple of uh, tiny house spaces sites uh, and it's for people who are actually looking to uh, place their tiny houses or people who say, we've got space here, you can bring your tiny house here. Uh, I think it's just tiny house spaces. Uh, you'd have to do a search because I can't remember the exact name. It's tiny house space or something. Just one other thing, uh, there's a gentleman I know of, and I'm not going to say where or anything. He's been living in a caravan in a shed for 17 years. <laughs> Council's known of him for 16 years. They often uh, wave as they uh, go past down this uh, piece of road. And basically the council has said to him, unofficially off the record, we know you're here, keep your head down, if we don't get a complaint, we're not going to move on it. And so, 17 years, he's been there. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent story. So, not only the council know about him being there, um, <laughs> they've, they've said, once again, that unless there's a complaint, yeah. they're doing it. So, once again, it's a complaint-driven system. The council must be seen to act on complaints. <coughs> What's your preferred maximum length and width for your tiny houses? Like, how much space do you have? Oh, a great question. And so do they have to have breaks? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Yes. Which question? Which question? For the benefit. Okay, um, I was just wondering what, as a builder of tiny homes, what's your preferred maximum for length and width? And do they have to have breaks? Like, how much space do you actually get to live in? Anything above two ton as a trailer must have brakes with the capacity to carry over two tons. Must have uh, must have um, electric brakes. All right. Um, anything under two ton, down to 750 kilograms, must have a different sort of brakes. Just the drum brakes. Anything under 750 kilograms, you don't need brakes for at all. You just tow it behind a trailer. You don't even need to have it um, uh, inspected. But we're generally looking at over that, between the two ton and 3.5 ton mark. Why in that area? Well, that gives us plenty of building to be able to build on a trailer. You're looking at, um, uh, we've actually done, done an experiment um, recently with, with, with a couple who are, who are here in the audience, I won't, I won't embarrass them at the moment, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. perfectly happy to be acknowledged there. We've got Jane and Warren McNaughton who uh, are using an aluminium trailer for their base and this is six meters by 2.5 meters and and that the weight of that trailer comes in at under a ton which lets us build two and a half ton on that to get up to a 3.5 ton rating and under 3.5 ton there are so many commercially available four-wheel drives i'm looking at three of two of them right now that will be able to tow um, up to 3.5 ton. When you get over 3.5 ton, you'd be looking at, um, well, uh, uh, a truck, basically, to be able to tow it. So what a lot of people are doing who want to be able to tow their, to tow their tiny home are looking uh, at, 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 at looking uh, you know, under the 3.5 ton mark, uh, which just makes it a lot easier to on-sell then to other people because most other people will only have a commercially available vehicle rather than a truck to be able to tow it around. Um, the reason we went with an aluminium trailer is because, uh, yeah, as I said, we can get 2.5 tonnes of, of building on that trailer to get under the 3.5 tonne limit that we, we, we set the trailer at. Um, whereas if you would, we would use a steel trailer, we would only have, uh, the weight would be probably 1,500 kilos or more, which would only give us uh, around that two tonne mark, which is still plenty for a six, by, a six by, by 2.5 metre building, 4.3 metres high. Um, usually, you know, the reason we're building so high is, is usually so, so we can put a loft in there, um, which means that you can open up all of the space underneath the loft uh, for you know a, a reasonably three quarter to, to full size kitchen and, and, and bathroom as well. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Yep. yeah it's so possible to go bigger. Do they have breaks? Don't yes. Have to. You must have brakes in, on anything that's towing uh, above 750 kilograms. So if you had to move off the land, could you go to a caravan park for a while? You can go to a, you can start a caravan park. Absolutely, you can go to a caravan park today. 
In fact, um, some people are looking into establishing tiny house communities, uh, eco villages and, and the like, and, and when we're looking at tiny houses on wheels, all you need to do to start one of those is start a caravan park. There's a few regulations to jump through, but if you have a caravan park, you can welcome tiny houses on wheels. For up to 59 days. <laughs> for up to 59 days. Is the um, manufactured uh, home parks the same as a caravan park? No. They are similar in certain ways, but no, there's different legislations that apply to, to both of those. Because that's what we've been advised, is that a Manufactured Home Parts Act mm. is a, something to look for yes, in definitely. tiny house yep. villages to get. Yeah, definitely. It's for, oh. because yeah, it's over 59 days. Sorry? Because it's over 59 yeah. days. Yeah. days. Sorry. Can you repeat the question on the mic? That's okay, I just wanted to hear what Ben said. Because it's over a 59 day stay, as soon as you go over a two month stay, it goes into permanent occupancy and the closest thing to fit is the manufactured home park code. Okay, my question was, is the manufactured home parks the same as a caravan park? And um, no, it's not. And I kind of remember what I was going to say then because I got a lot. Well, the manufactured home is such as always built to a building code. Yeah, I'll pass over to you guys because you need to talk about it. Yeah, the, what they call the manufactured home is always built to the building code and of course it gets a council approval to go into that particular home park. Whereas many years ago a lot that are in the home parks that we'll see it, who knows, cotton tree, whatever, they have been there for a lot of years and it was before that requirement. So for probably 15, 20 years it'll be been in them. They've always had to get council approval as a licensed dwelling done as per the building code with the necessary energy efficiency. So it's just a small version of a house and unfortunately that has heaped the price up quite a lot. And hence the people pay a lot of money for those homes in manufactured home parts. Good answer, thank you. Uh, I'll just, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, just Ian last week, um, he, we, we asked the question about tiny houses on wheels and the permanency and, you know, when they come under, you know, council regulations and so on. For, but he said if you build the tiny house to building code, like you're saying, um, even though you have it on wheels, you could still tie it down um, permanently to make it a permanent dwelling. Yeah. <laughs> the, the short answer to that is yes, you can uh, build a tiny house on wheels to tow um, if it's built to the building code, which then means a specific set of insulation requirements, electrical certification, engineering, which lo a lot of would come with the trailer anyway. The danger of that is that you end up with a very expensive tiny house. I think one, once you introduce, introduce all the regulatory framework that's around housing, to the tiny house industry, I think we'll find cost will blow out very quickly, the same as it did in manufactured housing in our space 15 years ago. Um, and it's the same as a manufactured house. You can, you can effectively take a tiny house somewhere, um, and if it's built to the building code, and you get an engineer uh, to design your footings, and those footings are put in and inspected by council, um, you can put it on blocks, for example, and just tie the tiny home down to those footings, which is what we used to do in the old days with manufactured homes. You would just have a, a footing that has a chain going to it, to the house. The idea being to stop it from blowing away, which is the, the primary purpose of a footing. Um, so the short answer is yes. The danger is, though, that when you start to do that, you're getting into the building code. Um, and the cost is going to blow out very quickly. And I suppose this is what we found and what I'm, uh, you know, again, with, whilst we don't have council here, it is an opportunity. Uh, by the way, we've invited council uh, twice now. They've indicated they're very keen to come, but haven't been able to put it together yet. Um, so we'll wait and see. Um, but I've found, in, in my case, I'm very paranoid about council and regulatory bodies getting involved too much. Um, the better you can fly under the radar, the longer that we can do that. Uh, to a degree, the better. I'm all up for compliance and all up for safety, but we found that cost is blows out immediately, regulation blows out immediately. They have one example of something goes wrong and the whole act changes. Um, that's the risk, I think, that we face with this tiny house thing. We're on the cusp of that now, and it's an important time, I think, because 
councils will start to develop precedents for this sort of thing and other councils will follow and that's what happens and it's it's a dangerous time it can make or break the tiny house industry for the future i think the question i have and i heard that you accommodated for my question in a way and that is you build your tiny homes to a weight and then you've got a gap in between. Now that gap I'm taking that you've allowed for people's knickknacks like the crockery and all that sort of thing to come in. Have you also included okay we want to take the tinny or let's put the tinny on top or we want to have solar and the panels and the weight of those. Things like, <coughs> excuse me, are things like that included in this variance in the weight? Good question. Yes, you must consider everything that's going to go onto the tiny house from the very start. Uh, if someone said we want to put a tinny on there, well, first of all, we need the storage solution for that. Uh, that's going to be ergonomically friendly, you know, able to be easily moved on and off. Um, that will come up in the design features and so forth. So what, what we do, Tiny Home Lolly Parks, uh, as, a, 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 as, a, as an experience with people is, is to help them design what they want to reflect their lifestyle. Because what we're building is custom made for them and no one else. We're not tied to any manufacturing um, guidelines. You know, we, 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 we produce this, these two models and that's it. Um, we work with custom builders uh, and, and, and craftspeople to ensure that people get what they want that's unique to them that reflects their lifestyle. And that, that's all, I guess, encapsulating that planning process to make sure that they're getting what they want and, and everything is, is accounted for or everything is considered before we swing in any hammers. Um, look, um, what's your name? Me too. Uh, ben, great points there. Uh, I, I really uh, do agree that this is a very uh, fragile time for the tiny house community in the way that we have an open and, and, and frank discussion with council. I think we do need to become available to them to be able to answer any questions they might have. Um, you know, I do understand that people who have the foresight and the and the um, wherewithal to be in a tiny house, off grid, living the lifestyle they want to live, not necessarily compliant with council right now, don't really want to put their hand up and, and, and be too involved um, or too vocal or too uh, disruptive in this process. And, and, and I think that's, that's a really good idea. I do think that we do need some sort of representation um, on, on, a, on a larger scale for, um, you know, for that process to occur. There, there has been a precedent set in Brisbane with one council and, and once again we are hoping that, um, you know, that, that carries great weight in terms of setting a precedent. The precedent is that, um, is that someone complained about a neighbour who uh, was living in a dwelling uh, next door to them and what was said was you know, this, this particular dwelling um, you know, it, it just arrived on the, on the land uh, next door to us in the suburbia uh, in, in Brisbane and, uh, and these people are living in it so they complained to council about that fact so council have come out and, and said, well, we, you, can't, you can't just build a place here um, on foundation that's, you know, without all the applying to council regulation. So there was an investigation and inquiry. It went to QCAT, uh, Queensland Civil... Um, Queensland Civil... Administrative Tribunal. Administrative Tribunal, thank you. And, uh, and what they what they discovered by, by going and, and examining the property was that it's not it was not in fact on one foundation. It was on wheels. It was not. No. No. And Brisbane is in a very different position, I believe, to the Sunshine Coast and, and the Gold Coast in that in, you know, they are a city. There is so much more money to be spent by trying to 
cater for people in the growth ring, in the outer area, more schools, more swimming pools, more everything, if they're going to expand that way. And they don't want to do that. So they're looking for solutions. They don't want to, we can't, the council don't want to spend that money on growing the city. It's a big city anyway. They want to, they're looking for solutions to infill within the city. There's a lot of big blocks around Brisbane where tiny houses can coexist and reduce the, the growth of the city but still cater for more people and spread people out a bit more and not require these um, these big inner city developments much to the chagrin of, of, um, of developers everywhere. Uh, but it could be a really good community and social solution to housing because that housing would be a tenth of the cost of what it is now to, to live in that suburb. So, hmm. Do you have any uh, input or idea on what the pressures might be from the lending institutions towards that sort of reduction in cost? Well, I think you might have the same idea that I do. They're not really happy with, with, with lending less money. Well, because, because the, the, the finance industry is such a hungry industry anyway, they've created so many products for people. And at the moment, there is actually a product that you can access to have a tiny house built for you. And it's just a, a personal loan of around 10%. And when you do the maths, it's probably still a really attractive offer to get a higher interest rate loan for a lower amount of money than it is to get a lower interest rate amount for a higher amount of money, which ties to a mortgage for 30 years rather than, rather than a five-year personal loan. But when I do the maths, I realise that a five-year loan on a, on a vehicle at 10% interest would mean that I could be living in a tiny house in, 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 in five months' time, well and truly settled in, and I don't have to look forward to another 30 years of work to pay off my own. I can have it paid off in five years, I have a more affordable life. Um, what, what price are you looking at when you start discussing that? Have yeah. you got a sort of couple of prices in mind that, that generally cover the sure. types of things? Sure, to, to, have a, to have a tiny home on wheels built to the lock-up, so that you can finish off the rest, is generally around thirty dollars to $40,000. Um, to have something that's, that's, that's small and easy to build, reducing the time to build, you're probably looking at forty dollars fifty thousand dollars and then to, to go through the design process to put a, a tinny rack on and, and, and absolutely customise it with unconventional sort of um, things, not a problem. It'll probably cost a bit more than $60,000. Yep. And then the yeah, solar systems, how many people need power, for what reasons, what are you running, that determines the cost of the solar system and, and all those kind of add-ons. Anyone else before I hand it back or to, to Julia? Well done, Ben. Well, Ben, um, I'm interested in the come housing kind of idea and one main building and then small buildings around, particularly for those who are over 50 and 60. Um, how does council view that in terms of well, as you said about being classified as a caravan park? But if you had some <laughs> smaller dwellings, how does council look at the amount of smaller dwellings that are allowed on, say, five acres of land? They look at them through very antiquated eyes. Okay, so we, we, we want to go through the process of working with the council to update their knowledge. Okay, I guess that's what we're looking to work to camp, work with council now to establish some frameworks and, and, some, and some dialogue to to have a better frame of reference because at the moment they don't do it real well. There are some hinterland areas um, around around here where that have been earmarked and there's a map that shows various places where ecotourism is encouraged and a, um, a house may have up to eight ancillary cabins, they call it. 
Yeah. You know, there's no distinguishment whether they should be on wheels or not. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'd say yes. Yes. I don't see why not. I don't see why a cabin could not be a tiny home, or more to the point, I don't see why a tiny home on wheels could not be classified as a cabin. Hmm. So there, there are there are things that I think we can test when it comes to council's uh, reaction. And, and and I mean, if we go in there knowing what the council bylaws are, and you know, there's some, some great documents to get through, lovely nighttime reading for you. Uh, but well worth it because if you say, well, I am approaching this project as being this, which fits into council guidelines, then that's what you work towards. And once again, it's only when there's a complaint, or if there's a complaint, that the council would ever be involved. Mm. And, and in that instance, you would say to them, well, I'm working within your guidelines that you've written here, and these are clearly cabins. With kitchenettes. Well, every, every good cabin's got a kitchen. Yeah. But, but it's up to you to determine. You know, I wouldn't be looking at the council to, to give me permission to do what I want to do in my life. <coughs> Uh, and wait for them to make a decision on that. I'll, I'll do it. And and if the, if, if, count, if council ever have a problem with it, or you can have a discussion with them about it. I think the biggest consideration for council is not necessarily your tiny home on wheels. It's how you're dealing with your waste. It's how you're dealing with your grey water, your black water, your sewage, etc. That's their biggest consideration. Um, so. Our tiny house, for instance, is going to have a composting toilet, a grey water system, etc, etc. So we will be dealing with our own ways. We won't be dealing with anyone having to deal with, or letting the council having to deal with it at all. So I think that's the, the biggest thing is, if you can argue that you are fully contained, you can be moved at any point, and you are dealing with your own waste in um, a sanitary way, then I think you've got your 90% there. I agree, absolutely, and that's why these rules and regulations and bylaws, that's why these bylaws came into play in the first place, to protect us from ourselves, in a sense, because people were getting very sick, living unsanitary lives, maybe because they didn't know any better, and you know, it was only 50, 100 years ago that we were all living as a family in a very small room, and that's how, that's how 